Good morning and welcome to Clemson United Methodist Church. I'm Fran Elrod, Senior Pastor here at CUMC, and we're glad you're here with us. No matter where you are in the world, we are glad that you have joined us at this time in this space for, for worship. I want to share a couple of announcements with you this morning. Um, we have an exciting afternoon planned on August the 23rd at 4 o'clock. August 23rd, 4 o'clock. We're going to have a back-to-school drive-through. Uh, it's a blessing of, uh, of our children and their backpacks. There's some surprises coming along, and this is for all ages, too, not just the kids. College students, teachers, anybody that wants to come drive through our parking lot at 300 Frontage Road, we would love to see you 4 o'clock at um, August the 23rd. Also, we continue our parking lot worship at 9 o'clock every Sunday morning. We simply ask that you come in, park every other space, bring your mask, wear your mask. And until you are situated, you are welcome to bring a chair and sit in front of your car or are socially distanced from others appropriately. We have parking lot monitors that will help you get in the right place so you can see and hear. And um, we also ask that we still refrain from hugging. Lots of air hugs, you can do that, and blowing kisses without really blowing kisses. Just any way we can greet one another with the peace of Christ without um, compromising our safety. And we'd love to see you in person here in our parking lot, 9 o'clock Sunday morning. And now I invite you to join me in the worship center for a time of thanksgiving and praise to God and worship. Let us join together in our opening prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, who is greater than the most powerful forces in this world, enable us to be still and know that you are God. O oh Lord, who answers out of the whirlwind of everyday life, breathe in us your Holy Spirit to strengthen, comfort, and guide us in the midst of the storm. O oh still, small voice, speak to us this hour that we might become makers of your peace in our homes, in our communities, in our world. We pray all this in the name of the one who calmed the raging sea. Amen. A reading from Psalm 133. 
Look at how good and pleasing it is when families live together as one. It is like expensive oil poured over the head, running down onto the beard, Aaron's beard, which extended over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon, streaming down onto the mountains of Zion, because it is there that the Lord has commanded the blessing, everlasting life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, I'm Amanda Thomas, the Director of Children and Youth. And today for our children's moment, I want us to think for just a little bit about how often we forget things or we forget to do things. You know, there is one thing that I am always forgetting and losing, and that is my keys. I never put them in the same place. I throw them on my desk and they get covered up with papers. I put them in my purse. I throw them on the kitchen counter or the kitchen table. And so when it's time for me to go somewhere or to need them, I'm constantly going, where are my keys? Where are my keys? And having to look around because I don't practice putting them in the same place the whole time, every time. And so a lot of people, in order to try to remember things, they'll make a list and they'll write it on a list. They'll put a piece of string around their finger or a rubber band around their wrist and they'll look at it and it'll help them to remember, oh yeah, I'm supposed to do that or I'm supposed to call so-and-so. And what I want us to think about is the Bible tells us that each and every day we are to praise God in all that we do. We're to love God in all that we do. And what if we did that every day? What if we really made an effort to practice that in all that we do and in, in how we interact and in how we treat each other and how we think about things? What if we praised God and we loved God in all that we did? And so that's my challenge for you this week. In everything you do, in conversations you have, in the way that you interact with people, praise God, show God's love, and live into what God calls us to do as disciples of Christ. And so that's our challenge for this week. So let us pray together. Heavenly and gracious God, we pray that you would just give us the strength and the courage and help us to remember to praise you in all circumstances, to praise you and love you each and every day in each conversation we have and each interaction. Just help us to show your love and help us to practice that in all that we do so that our lives are just wonderful examples of how great your love is. Thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here now a reading from Romans chapter 11, selected verses. So I ask you, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. I'm an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God hasn't rejected his people whom he knew in advance. God's gifts and calling can't be taken back. Once you were disobedient to God, but now you have mercy because they were disobedient. In the same way, they have also been disobedient because of the mercy that you received. So now they can receive mercy too. God has locked up all people in disobedience in order to have mercy on all of them. God's riches, wisdom, and knowledge are so deep. They are as mysterious as his judgments, and they are as hard to track as his paths. Who has known the Lord's mind? Or who has been his mentor? Or who has given him a gift and has been paid back by him? All things are from him and through him and for him. May the glory be to him forever. Amen. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious God, your word is so precious to us. There is a mystery to be unlocked within these words, and we pray now that your Holy Spirit descends upon us, opens our hearts, and unlocks that mystery and infuses us with all your love, forgiveness, and grace. And we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. When I was about seven years old, I began taking piano lessons because in my family, we are a musical family and everyone played an instrument of some kind or another or sang. I was not gifted at an early age with the gift of singing and so I learned to play the piano. I had a pretty tough piano teacher too. Laverne Bailey was very stern, but she was excellent. I learned a lot from her. My siblings took piano from her as well, but not quite as long because they just didn't want to deal with, let's just say, the teacher's wrath when things weren't going the way she thought they should go while we were learning our music. 
But I stuck with it because it was something important to me and something that I thought I wanted to be very perfect at doing this. I met someone the other day, though, that said they started taking piano. We were comparing our family music um, talents, and she said to me, I took piano lessons for about a year, and my teacher asked me to quit. And so just to know that everyone has been given some kind of talent, and some of us are, have been able to perfect maybe, no, not quite, but perhaps maybe practice that talent and become better at it. So for eight years, and some of those years seemed longer than others, there were times that I just wanted to quit because I couldn't seem to get over that little hump that I was in uh, of not progressing the way I wanted to, or I didn't want to practice. I got tired of practicing, but I took those piano lessons, and I continued to drive through and practiced and practiced and practiced. As a child, I was a sleepwalker. And I have plenty of stories I could tell you about sleepwalking, and I would talk in my sleep. But on one particular night, my parents watched me leave my bedroom and walk into the living room, sit down at the piano, and began playing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. And once I had played through it several times, and apparently while still asleep, had gotten it to where I was satisfied where I, where I was at that practice level, then I got up and I went back to bed. I don't remember one bit of this, but according to them, I played it beautifully and went to bed and all was well. And it is still to this day my favorite classical piece of music. There is an importance, though, to practicing continuously. Much like Amanda shared with her children's sermon today, you know, we need to continuously practice our praises and thanksgiving to God. And so, it is important to practice any of the talents that God has given to us. I can tell you that I don't play the piano very much right now. I haven't in quite some time. I just don't take the time and don't seem to have the discipline to take the moments that each day I should take a little bit of time and practice and keep that skill up. It's so bad now that I don't think I could even hammer out chopsticks, much less Jesus Loves Me and definitely not Moonlight Sonata. But I still have the talent. God has given me that talent. I just don't practice it very often, and I'm pretty rusty with it. I suspect if I sat down at the piano now, and I might have to start over in some things that I might have been able to do 25 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, but I would really have to practice hard to get back to the place. But I also think that I would remember that the great talent that God had given me was something that couldn't be taken away and will always be there. God has given all of us gifts, talents, different ones to the diversity of all God's creation. You have gifts that I don't have and talents that I don't have, and I have gifts and talents that you don't have. But of all of the gifts that we have been given, none of them that have been given to us by God can ever be taken away. Once given, the gifts of God are permanent and not able to be taken back. God will not take them back, and there's no way we can give them back. Um, I hear people often say, oh, no, I'm not very good at that. When they do a marvelous job, well, guess what? You have a talent or a gift that you just cannot give back to God. I have a family member who I call the queen of returns. She'll buy um, home decor galore, new bedding or window treatments or pictures and even with the clothes, and before you know it, she's on the way back to the store to return whatever it is. She thought she liked it. She gets it home. She doesn't think she likes it. It doesn't work, and then she returns it. And I also know people who will take a gift that's been given to them and not think twice about taking it to the store and return it. We even put gift receipts in our, our presents to other people now just in case you don't like it or just in case it doesn't fit or just in case whatever, you can return it for something else. And then I confess that I've done this one once or twice in my life, and I bet you have too, and that I received a gift that I re-gifted, 
perhaps it didn't quite suit my taste or my, um, my liking to something, and so I could wrap it up and give it to somebody else in another town, and nobody would even know that I'd done that. But not God. God's gifts to us are irrevocable, as Paul has told us in this Roman scripture. You can't give it back. Paul understands the culture and the Jewish people with which he is writing to and that they've lived for so long with an understanding or I think a misunderstanding that if God's people did not obey God, then God was going to punish them and that all the gifts that God had given them, whether they were gifts of prosperity or peaceful living or protection, could just easily be taken away by God if we didn't do what God wanted us to do. And our human condition, especially with one another, makes us behave that way sometimes, doesn't it? Have you ever heard anyone say, and I don't mean not just at church, although it happens here too, but perhaps in any organization, well, if they are going to do it that way, then I'll just stop volunteering. Or maybe you've heard, I'll just stop giving my tithes and offerings to the church if they're going to do it this or that way or going to be that way about it all. Or maybe even there are plenty of other churches to go to. I'll just take my talents and my gifts and go somewhere else. It certainly seems that the stories that we find in the Bible about the ways people behave could easily earn us threats like that in the community of faith, doesn't it? And the Bible contains a variety of accounts of of the way that God punishes the people who disobey, the people who don't follow the command to be the people of God. But the gifts of God cannot be taken away or given back. So irrevocable are the gifts of God that even the threat of taking them back cannot and does not happen. It's just not going to happen. God's gift to us are forever gifts and should never be taken for granted. And I'm guilty at times for taking for granted the many gifts that God has given to each and every one of us that we just can't give back. But back to the piano lessons. I had to practice and practice a lot in order to accomplish what Mrs. Bailey gave me to learn every week. And sometimes I just did not like to sit down at the piano and practice. But I had to practice because it is what students of God's gifts do. We practice with those gifts. And it is God's expectation that we will practice whatever gift that we've been given and use it to the glory of God. These gifts were not given for us to use just for ourselves, to keep for ourselves, but were also given to the glory of God and to be used in our community. It's the same way with athletes, gymnasts, dancers, even actors, although some people get by pretty well without having to practice too much about being an actor. But all of those have to be developed. I've often used the phrase, he's a natural at this, or she's a natural at that, when describing what appears to obviously be a talent of someone's. But even those who we see who are naturals at doing stuff, something, still have to develop that talent. They have to learn the rules. They have to practice a discipline, if you will. Our gifts are the basic talents and skills and an ability to refine the basic talent, which is also our gift from God, which God is not going to take back. No matter how bad you may want to give it away or give it back, God has given you something to keep. But I also believe that there are three, there are more than three, but three that I want to talk about this morning, specific gifts that God has given to every single person. Even in our diversity and diversity of talents, there are three things that God has given to each one of us, and they are irrevocable gifts from God. They cannot be returned, and God will never take them back. But each of these three also need practice, lots of practice, intentional practice, so much practice that we become people 
of these gifts and not just people with these gifts. They become a part of who we are because they are already in us. First, we have all been given the gift of love. Some people, some things are difficult to love, but we have been given that gift of love to practice, to look at one another, even in our differences, even in our disagreements, even with just whatever may divide us or keep us from looking at one another as the other person with the gift of love as well, have been given that gift. And we are called by God because we know that God is love and God has called us to love one another, to be kind to one another, to always do everything that we do in love. The greatest of all these gifts is love. It is, it is, it's all through the New Testament through Jesus Christ, and that God so loved the world that he gave us his only son. And so each and every one of us has been given that gift of love. It's in our very being. It's in our very soul. But we have to work on practicing it every day. Second, I believe that each one of us has been given the ability or the gift of the ability to forgive. And that's a tough one. Sometimes we see some things as more difficult to forgive than others. But forgiveness is something that we continue to have to practice. Sometimes it's a process because the wound from whatever has caused us to be angry or to hold a grudge or to have been wounded and need to be able to forgive or be forgiven is so deeply within us that it just takes practice in a process. Sometimes whatever has happened that we need to practice the gift of forgiveness is hard to cope with. And so it does take time, but it takes a willingness also to work on it. It takes acceptance that God has given you, that God has given me the gift of forgiveness. And nothing we do, no matter how much we beg, we will never, be give, be, we will never have that gift of forgiveness taken away. And last, we have all been given the gift of grace. You know, I made a lot of mistakes playing the piano, and if I sat down right now and even tried to play chopsticks, I bet I would make some mistakes. And as tough as Mrs. Laverne Bailey was when I was taking piano lessons from her, and at times as scared as I was to walk into her studio knowing that I had not practiced, and she would be able to tell from the mistakes that I made while she was teaching the lesson. There was always grace. There was always grace to understand that I could start over again and again and again, and that even today I could pick up that piano playing and work towards perfection again. I never got to perfection, by the way, but I'll talk about that in a minute. God's gift of grace through Jesus Christ has given us all the ability, too, to receive God's grace. And with love and forgiveness and grace, these are gifts that all of us have and that we can practice with one another and practice for ourselves so that we become that body of Christ, that peace-filled the peace of Christ with us, loving, forgiving community. These gifts of love, forgiveness, and grace also present us with responsibilities as disciples of Jesus Christ that at times appear to be beyond our capacity. In our culture, with the divisions that we see, with what we are going through, especially right now, individually, as a community, as the world, with the pandemic, among all of the many other things, sometimes love or forgiveness or grace seem beyond our capacity. But I would challenge us and ask, let us be kind to one another. Start every day new before your feet hit the floor in the morning. Start every day new with a, with a prayer of thanksgiving that you have a brand new opportunity and a gift of being able to practice love, forgiveness, and grace. Practice this. Love one another. Start each day new so that we don't miss out on the opportunity to experience within ourselves, 
and with others the gifts of love, forgiveness, and grace. And then let us be less judgmental of one another. When we are focused on one another's faults and mistakes, we miss the possibility to develop our potential to love better, to forgive more, and to extend grace. I am reminded every day that each one of us stands in the need of God's grace. I do. And I am grateful that God gifted me with a musical talent and you with a talent or more talents. But I am grateful even more so that God has gifted all of us together with the gifts of love and forgiveness and grace and for the amazing opportunity every single day to practice these gifts that each of us has been given, knowing that none of us are going to get it right all the time. We're not. Not one of us. And then on any given day or week, I'm going to mess up over and over and over again. But I'm going to keep practicing love, forgiveness, and grace, and hope that you will keep practicing that with me as well. You know, each of these gifts being practiced begins to perfect the other two. Think about it. If you practice love, if you just keep practicing love, let's just choose that for today, and I'm going to practice love, then you are working on grace and forgiveness. If you practice just forgiveness for this time, then you are working on love and grace. And if you are practicing grace, then you are working on forgiveness and love. John Wesley, in his theology of grace, of the prevenient and justifying and sanctifying grace, said that we are to move towards perfection, towards that sanctification, towards that place in life where we are in union with Christ, in union with Christ's church, that we are loving and forgiving and full of grace. And we're all a work in progress, and we're all going on to, per for, uh, going on to perfection. You know, from my last piano recital, I had to me memorize pages and pages and pages of music. And I practiced what seemed like endless hours every day. I would practice when I got home from school. I would run that music through my head every moment I had while I was at school. And on the weekends, I would practice for hours and several times each day in preparation for that recital day. But when I stood up for the final bow after I played the last piece, I knew I had come a long way, but I also knew I, I still had a long way to go to be the best that I could be. When we practice love and forgiveness and grace, we are moving towards a big day that as we join the church triumphant and we stand up and perhaps are able to take a bow for the life that we've led, we want God to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant, because we have practiced love and forgiveness, and grace. And as disciples of Jesus Christ, moving towards per perfection, we all have a long way to go. But be encouraged that each and every one of you and I have irrevocable gifts of love, forgiveness, and grace within us to greet us every morning with a fresh start and a new horizon. Back in August 1996, I took a trip to the beach I love to go and, and look at the shells, and um, I look at the broken ones and the perfect ones, but mo mo most often we like to find perfect shells on the beach so that we can do, take them home, decorate, do whatever. But I was going through a very difficult time in my life, and I was taking a stroll on the, on the beach and looking down at the, the sand and all of the shells that were there, and this came to mind, and so I pinned this, and I've titled it, Going On to Perfection. Each day they pass us by looking for the perfect one, one that is perfect shape, perfect color, and is without blemish. If only one would stop to lift one of us up and look more closely, 
You see, it is not by chance that we are washed ashore. Each of us is on a journey that has encountered waves pushing us forward and then pulling us back, others just like us, and even thousands of teeny tiny grains of sand that brush against us each day. And now we lay basking in the glorious light of the sun and gentle breeze. So where are the perfect ones? They remain hidden beneath the surface underneath the sand, tucked away in darkness. Maybe by chance they will surface, perhaps by choice. And if they do rise to the top, most, too, will experience the trials and turbulence of a journey. Yes, a few do make it without being broken, but rarely do they come ashore unscathed. But for all who are on a journey and carried ashore, there they find rest and light that shines brighter than anything imagined while buried beneath a blanket of sand and immured by water. Together we dwell along the shore, many as we are, revealing a journey well-traveled and a glorious light graciously given. Let us pray. Most holy God, we are grateful for this day, this new day that you have given to us. It is a clean slate, for you have given us a night of rest. And though we may have brought illness with us into this day, or we may have brought our wounds, our difficulties, our struggles, You've given us a new day. Thank you. We ask in this day that we will focus on loving you more, being loved by those who are practicing their love, and loving one another. And that in those places and those wounds that need forgiveness, that we begin to explore that possibility knowing that it may happen in a moment, but also knowing that it may take a process. It may take a little while. But if we practice and we love and we know your grace as you have forgiven us, then perhaps, God, we will learn to be better forgivers. On this day, we pray for our church. As the building continues to echo And yet we are congregating as the people of God in the community of faith in new, fresh ways, Lord, that make us a little uncomfortable, but we're practicing and we're striving for that perfection. We know that things will come and things will go, and we sometimes want to hold so hard to the past, and yet you've given us a new day to look forward. And so, God, on this day, love us a little more. Forgive us completely. Grant us your grace. Be our teacher. Show it to us each, Lord, so that we in turn can be that to others. Loving a little more, forgiving completely, and filled with your grace. For we pray these things in the name of the greatest love, the one who died for for our, our forgiveness of sins, and the one who shows his grace upon us every day, Jesus Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as an act of worship, I suppose there's another gift that we offer to God that God has placed into each of us, and that is the gift of thankfulness. In our offering of our gifts and our tithes to God, we are saying thank you for what you are doing for us each and every day. And I personally want to say thank you to the Clemson family, to the um, many ways that you have been generous through this difficult time. I realize that we are on our 22nd Sunday out of the building, and yet we have remained faithful in what we believe is the community of faith in giving thanks to God. I pray for your generosity as we continue the mission and ministry to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Receive this benediction. Go in peace. And may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.